Hey guys, Woodruff here. Um, I'm coming back to talk about IV access. Someone requested more information about um, different types of IVs that a patient might have and then considerations around um, how you're gonna manage these devices as the nurse. So I already have a video on central lines and um, bigger types of IVs that you might manage in considerations around them. You can find that under the hemodynamics um, a PowerPoint that's under uh, the playlist. If you look under cardiovascular unit one for complex, you can find more about central lines under the hemodynamics video. This will be more about um, peripheral IV access and pick lines and things like that. Well, let's try to go forward. So let's talk about peripheral IVs. So this is gonna be what most of us are gonna be dealing with regardless of where we work. And this is one of those times that size does matter. Because as the nurse, you always want to know like what access that you're working with because it can affect what kind of medications that you can give and what you're working with. So, you know, you can see the different sizes here. Um, we all love to have a good green, which is an 18. The pink is a 20. The blue is a 22. And the yellow is a 24. So the smaller the number, the bigger the size um, when it comes to IV catheters. Um, most people, we go for 20s. Like most people's veins will fit a 20. Some people have very good veins and we can do an 18. Some people have puny veins. That's where we're going for the 22s. Um, but you want to know uh, when you're getting report, you always want to ask um, what size the catheters are because you especially kind of just helps prepare in your mind. Um, because for example, let's say I have a patient who's anemic and is going to need blood and all they have is 22s. Can I give blood with a 22? Absolutely. Um, if it's life or death, I, I get this question a lot. We talk about it a little bit when we talk about blood transfusion is what do you do if you don't have an 18 or a 20 to give blood? We can still give it, but it has a higher chance of getting clogged or having a problem with that IV access versus if we have a bigger access. So sometimes let's say that it's a new patient and I'm putting an IV in, I want to consider what might this patient need. A 20 is pretty sufficient for most patients and can give most basic medications. But if I can get an 18 in a patient, I'm all for it. Um, so as the nurse, my role is to know what size my catheter is. And then every shift and sometimes multiple times a shift, depending on if the patient has a lot of infusions, things like that, I'm going to be assessing the site. I'm going to be looking. And what I'm going to be looking for is when I'm looking at their catheter, I want to see the insertion site. Is the catheter still in? Is it kinked? Is there something off with that insertion? Two, I want to be looking at um, how my dressing looks. Is my dressing saturated? Is there any sort of like fluid around? Is there leaking happening around that dressing? Um, does my dressing need to be changed? Then I also want to be looking at uh, what's going on around the site of insertion. Is there any redness? Is there any swelling? What does it look like right above that insertion site? Um, that can tell me a lot of information. Then I need to assess patency, and this is really important. You'll see a lot of people, especially if you go places where, you know, every patient ends up having an IV for a long period of time, sometimes if they're in the hospital for a while, and when they're getting to a point where we're not really using it anymore, you'll find that some nurses, unless they're putting something through it, they're not going to be flushing it once a shift. Uh, most of the time on your MAR, once a shift, you'll have a flush and you're supposed to actually be flushing your IV. If you don't have that, even if you don't have that, you still should be flushing your IV once a shift at least. Um, cause it helps to keep the patency because there's the, um, the whole thing. I think I have it on another slide where if you don't use it, you lose it. So, um, these things, they don't just self-sustain. If you don't keep them patent, they can clot off. And, um, then that's the that patient ends up having to get another stick when we could have prevented that. So when I assess, uh, say assess patency, what I'm saying is, is that we want to um, uh, check and flush it and see if it flushes. And uh, not only just see if it flushes, is it hard to flush? Like when you're pushing the flush, are you having to work really hard? Um, or is it not that much of a, um, uh, what do you call it, a struggle just to get the flush in? Then you also want to look at the length of time that it was inserted. Every hospital policy is different. The hospital that I work at, we can keep peripheral IVs in as long as they're good, sometimes a week or more. 
just depends. But that's why we regularly check paint and see. We're checking the site. We're checking, hey, do we still need it? Um, there's times I've worked and um, people are just throwing a ton of tons of IVs in a patient. And eventually it's like, we don't need all of these. Um, most floors want at least one peripheral IV. I work ICU, so we usually like to have two. Um, it depends on what the patient needs. A patient may need more than that, depending on if they have a lot of not compatible IV infusions. Um, but when you're looking at I, uh, your peripheral IVs, you don't want to just look at IVs. You want to look at your med list too and see what am I using as far as there anything going in it. If there's nothing going in it, I need to make a point of flushing it once a shift and seeing how easy or difficult it is to flush. Um, we also sometimes check drawback, which is where we flush the IV and then we pull back after we flush a little bit and see if any blood comes out. And that tells us, hey, are we still in? Now you can have a good IV that doesn't have drawback, um, but it just helps to tell you kind of how that catheter's doing a little bit. So what can go wrong? Um, some two things that can go wrong I'm going to focus on that and then I'll talk about the first two. Um, the first is what's called phlebitis. And that's what this picture here in the center is. And think phlebitis is an angry blood vessel. Um, it's an itis, it's an inflammation, and it's where either a medication irritated the blood vessel or the IV catheter irritated the blood vessel. And you can see how it gets angry, inflamed. And sometimes it looks like this where you see the tracking, the redness all the way up the vessel. Sometimes it's just red right above, but you should not see redness like this um, right above your catheter. That should be a warning sign, hey, this needs to go. And so with phlebitis, we take the catheter out because the catheter or the medication that's going in that blood vessel is the irritant and you need to find yourself some other access. Um, then there's what's called infiltration, which is this. So the catheter is obviously out. The, the first step in infiltration is take that catheter out because usually it's not in the right place. Infiltration is not a problem in the blood vessel. It's a problem around the blood vessel. What's happened is that catheter has slipped outside of the blood vessel or something happened where medication infiltrated or got in the tissue. And you can see this person has blisters as a result of the medication that went in their tissue. The difference here is phlebitis. You're just treating an inflammation and irritation. You're taking that catheter out and getting a new IV access. This will go away. Um, with infiltration, we're more worried because there's actually been medication going into the tissue. So usually you have to look on your... Um, like whatever your hospital has for their uh, pharmacy, like I'm trying to think of the word for it. I'm um, like, we have like LexiComp or, you know, like the pharmacy, not module. I can't really think of the word for it, but I know y'all will probably um, comment and tell me what I, the word I can't think of right now. Um, but it's like the resource um, for pharmacy um, that your hospital has, or you can talk to a pharmacist and they can tell you what you need to do because depending on what medication infiltrated, um, that will depend on what you need to do when it comes to if this happens. Um, other reminders, again, don't forget to monitor and flush your line regularly, use it or lose it. And then keep in mind when you're um, hanging an IV drug, always check in the um, instructions if it needs a filter. There are certain medications like Dilantin, Amiodarone, um, things like that that require this filter. And this is what this is down here. Um, it effectively helps to break down like really thick um, medications or helps to make it um, more gentle or easy to go into the blood vessel or the vein. Um, when you are administering certain drugs. So always look, and if it asks for a filter, make sure you're always adding that filter because that can also change um, or put you more at risk for phlebitis. It can put you more at risk for losing that IV. So there's also what are called IDCs or midline catheters. Depending on where you work, they might have different names. This effectively, think of this as like a superhero IV. Um, it's usually ultrasound guided, and you're usually going to see it in the arm or the larger vessels, the upper arm, I should say, in the larger vessels. It's a longer catheter, so you can see here this midline, see how it goes all the way up to the shoulder, whereas a pick line goes all the way to the heart, but a midline just goes up a little bit higher, so it is a longer catheter. Um, you're going to follow the same considerations as a peripheral IV. It's going to have the same assessments. You just want to be super careful and always follow your hospital policies. They might have a more sterile procedure or a different procedure for um, removal. Usually the people that are going to be placing these are going to be your IV access team or your pick line team. It's not something um, that most hospitals that I've seen at least that a regular bedside nurse will be inserting. Um, some, uh, what do you call it? Some places you work, like where I work, nurses can learn how to put in an ultrasound guided. That's a little bit of a longer catheter, but these IDCs or midline are a little bit, um, deeper, longer. So they require a little bit more specialty training.
And that leads us to last but not least the pick line. So the pick line is great. You want to think about, again, remember how I brought up how you always want to be thinking about like, what does your patient need? So if I come in, if I have a patient that um, has one or two peripheral IVs, we're having horrible access there. And the doctor's like, Hey, they're going to need to be on antibiotics, IV antibiotics for months. You know, this is where we start talking about a pick line or what are our options? Or if I have a patient that just has horrible IV access or limited access, everyone's been trying, but no one can seem to get good access on them. This is when I start thinking about a pick line for my patient. And it's definitely, um, you know, it's your role as a nurse. You can you can um, mention this to the doctor about, hey, what do you think about a pick line for a patient if you think they might qualify? Now, this is not something we put in lightly. So they usually have to meet certain qualifications like long-term antibiotics, uh, multiple uh, long-term IV medications, multiple incompatible medications, difficult IV access. And they also have to, we have to consider certain things like um, some patients in the hospital that need long-term antibiotics or may need a PICC line might also have other problems, like they might be dialysis patients or future dialysis patients. And I've worked places where PICC line nurses will want to uh, uh, talk to nephrology before even um, thinking about it. Like even if the patient's not on dialysis yet, but we're kind of headed in that direction, sometimes they have to get approval from the nephrologist because they don't want to take a spot. Because if they um, if they mess with any of the blood vessels when they're inserting that pick line, if a clot forms, if anything happens, that's a uh, dialysis axis that gets ruined that they won't be able to use in the future. So it's just something always to consider. Um, and there's some patients that have arm restrictions. Um, I have a patient that I was taking care of recently that has like bilateral arm casts. And then it's like impossible. Like, where do we insert something? That patient has a central line because there's nowhere else to put um, everything else for them. So you just there's a lot of things to consider. Some patients need a pick line, but we can't even insert one because of they have poor access. Some people end up in the hospital with lots of blood clots, whether they're small or large. And so it's just impossible to find a spot to even put a pick line in. Um, but there's someone whose job, this is a, a pick line, there is a pick line nurse or an, uh, they usually call them like a vascular access team that works at most hospitals. And they're the, going to be the ones that insert these pick lines. It's ultrasound guided and it's a sterile procedure. They have to get consent from the patient first. Um, it is a bigger procedure than any other type of IV. Um, the things to consider after insertion as the nurse, if I have a patient with the pick line is one, I want to know how many ports I have. Some pick lines, I'm, I've always, generally, you're always going to see two. Occasionally, I've seen an odd one that was not a midline, um, but usually you're going to have at least two, um, uh, what do you call them, catheter or ports. So you want to know how many ports there are. Then you also want to know, because um, there can be, uh, the most I've seen is three. They have, they have triple lumen picks and uh, most people either get a double lumen or a triple lumen. So when I'm getting a report, I want to know how many ports. I want to know if they're working because sometimes, oddly enough, one port will work, another one won't. One will draw, the other one won't. So you want to know what's going on with them how it patent it is. Um, there's usually hospital policies vary, but there's usually like set schedules and stuff for changing these um, dressings and things like that. And what you're going to do when it comes to um, changing out, um, uh, what do you call it? The bio patch and stuff, which is that circle thing that goes over top. It helps to keep it clean. Um, the other thing to keep in mind compared to peripheral IV, their sterile dressing changes. You know, like my hospital, sometimes the um, pick line nurses themselves will change out the pick line dressings, but sometimes just depending, nurse other nurses will change them out too. But there's a very set procedure. Um, sometimes these have a higher chance of clotting off. So what you might see happen sometimes if these clot off is we actually, um, and you get an order for a little bit of TPA. You're not actually giving it to the patient. You're just putting it in the line and you literally um, push a little bit in the line, let it sit there for a while. And it breaks down any clots that are in the line. And then you actually aspirate it and take it out. Cause you never want to be <laughs> given to TPA to these patients. You're really giving TPA to the catheter. Um, and so, yeah, so th those are some things to kind of keep in mind that yes, these are great because they usually can draw blood. Yeah. You don't have to poke your patients. And then, um, they also allow for multiple medications and they usually are really good for CTs too, CT compatible. That's something I didn't, I also forgot to mention when I was talking about size matters for IV catheters, like general peripheral IVs. It also matters for CT because, um, CT will not inject contrast into a small IV. It has to be the 
and a, a good place and a good size for them to do that. But anyway, so um, a lot of these we will see on the side will say like power port or power injectable so they can hand handle the power of the contrast uh, injector that's a little bit more rapid. Um, so that's good for that. But the one thing, again, the considerations you just want to keep in mind is one, sterility, because this goes straight to your heart. So if you do not manage this well, if you do not keep it clean, if you're not changing your caps, um, which the caps are these things here. If you're not changing those and keeping up with your dressing and keeping things clean, a patient can end up with a very serious infection or sepsis. Um, and then you also have to worry about them clotting off. They're more likely to clot off because they're in a bigger blood vessel. And um, uh, sometimes just their placement there um, can put them at higher risk for that. So keeping up with your general maintenance, these also need to be flushed. All the other catheter, all the catheters I've talked about need to be flushed regularly, especially these pick lines. Um, and we assess also for the blood drawback to see how they're doing. Um, so yeah, so these ones are more focused on cleanliness and um, keeping that patency up and uh, uh, maintaining it, especially because again, it's a lot, it's a big procedure. It's more for them to do, et cetera. So anyway, hopefully this is what you were looking for when it comes to learning about IVs. If you have any questions or need any follow-ups, please let me know. Always a pleasure to help. Hope you're doing well.